Preface of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface The present day interest in monologues, which has prompted the publication of this little book, seems to warrant a foreword of comment. The monologue is a character study in little the apotheosis of a chosen individuality. It may be simply a rough sketch, or it may be a finished miniature. It depends entirely upon the monologist. Three things seem to be essential to a successful monologist. First, the power of keen observation. The man who intends to characterize must be a student of character. He must find a new text and a new chapter in every streetcar and on every street corner. In the second place, he must be able to impersonate, to sink his own personality completely in that of the character he wishes to represent. He must, by walk, expression, intonation, and gesture, become that character. In the third place, he must be able to make an audience understand the unspoken half of the conversation, and he must have the ability to make the one character he delineates typical of a whole class. All the character studies in this book are intended to be spoken by one person, although the monologue form is not always retained. In some of the sketches, the reader is required to do double duty and impersonate two speakers, which necessitates, of course, complete change of character. No definite rules can be insisted upon as to the best method of presenting monologues. All the little studies in this book have stood the test of trial before varied audiences. The successful rendition of them must be left to the discretion of the reader. M.B.C. End of Preface Sketch Number One of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage Directions and Role of Gwendolyn Phillips Read by Linda Olson Fytak Los Angeles. Sketch number one. Cupid plays coach. Scene. The porch of a golf club. The men and girls are having tea. There are a tea table and a chair at one side of the porch. Time. Afternoon of the annual woman's tournament. Enter Gwendolyn Phillips, winner of the cup. Gwen speaks. Hello, everybody. You beat me in, didn't you? takes off hat and jabs imaginary pins through it. Well, I had to stop and talk to everyone I met. That's the bother with being a babbler. Looks from one to another in surprise. What's this? What's all this? Oh, nonsense. I mean, oh, thank you. But talk about my luck, not my victory. It's all luck and golf nods toward girl at tea table. Yes, I will have some tea, thanks. Just put everything in it. Motions to man. No, no, now don't get up. I don't want to sit down. I'd much rather sit back here and swing my feet as no perfect lady would ever do. Perches on portrayal. Pass over my tea, will you, Dicky Todd? Takes teacup from him. Much obliged. That looks nice, and tastes better. Funny thing about luck, isn't it? Some days my little god of luck just seems to sit on the tip-top of every club I've got. I simply can't miss the ball, not if I try. Just make my arms go, and he does the rest. Sips tea. Tell you something secret, everybody. I'd never think of going into a match like today's, for instance, without burning two fat sticks of Japanese incense before my god of luck. <laughs> she sips her tea. Pagan, did you say, Dicky Todd? Of course, I'm a pagan. We all are. Nonsense. Why, we are. We all bow down before idols of some sort. Oh, there are lots of kinds, Dicky. Wood, brass, and stone. As for you, my son, I think we all know the size, shape, and complexion of your idol. Suggestive glance toward girl at the tea table. 
so you needn't cast any pebbles at mine very good tea mabel goes and deposits her cup on table no not just now thanks you come out and let me spill the tea oh come on i'll drink more than all the rest of you so it will just save time that's right she sits at tea table won't you have a cup yourself dear how will you have it two sugars and a lemon excuse the fingers hands her cup anybody else ready well what did you go round in margaret did you really good for you what did you do we drop in you don't say i give you my word of honour i never worried over anything in my life as i did over that hole i've tried for it all night long in my dreams for two mortal weeks those awful dreams you know that couldn't come true i always seem to be swinging my club and swinging my club and yet i never hit the ball then i open my eyes and i see it speeding off toward the fifth and i know i must have missed the fourth and have to come back tripling my strokes Phew. each night i've dreaded going to sleep and facing the tragedy again have some more tea someone do thank you dicky i thought i could depend on you takes his cup and refills it as she talks dicky my boy you're a tank for tea and when you're old oh very very old as old as i am you'll turn into a little crumpled green old man like a leaf of oolong tea here lies the grave of dicky todd who lies in peaf beneath the sod alas he died to drink no more quite steeped in tea instead of law <laughs> not so bad offhand dicky see what i've done for you mabel is convulsed with emotion never mind mabel dear don't take it so to heart the worst has not yet come won't somebody have some more tea it's a drug on the market since i took charge i'll have to drink it myself pours herself a cup then in an overly careful unconscious manner here comes mr lawrence shakes hands with him how do you do will will you have some of my wares you hate tea oh what a philistine now that's very gallant i'm sure but i'm loath to dispense unwelcome favours thank you mr lawrence i've just been telling them all about my luck the idea of doing weedrap in four i had expected to do it in fourteen with much effort i surprised myself i even surprised my caddy and that's a triumph worth boasting of what's the matter looks from one to another going is it exeunt omnes you desert too dicky going to burn incense before your idol hope she proves kind good night see you tomorrow mabel good-bye nods farewell after them then turns to lawrence well mr lawrence we seem to be the only survivors survival of the fittest <laughs> modest so will you look at that sunset let's go over to the other end of the porch where we can see it better she moves to other side of porch and sits on railing yes it has been a happy day for me one likes to excel in things even if it's only golf oh but i don't you know i'm not good at all in lots of games i can play tennis i play at rackets but i'm a perfect dub at croquet love ah that's a game i never play it hasn't any rules you know and i won't play a game without rules interrupting him smiling now that's just the trouble these games where you make your own rules you never know who wins that's very gallant but i'm not at all sure i would well you see i play at so many games i really don't think i have time for any more oh you want to teach me you're a professional 
only amateur well that's encouraging is it is it a very hard game to understand as easy as that well i may be able to grasp it i warn you though i'm awfully stupid the bland expression of a seeker for knowledge spreads over her face now what you choose you play partners do you well i i've chosen you have to tell whom you've chosen oh well i'll choose again i choose well i choose you now what look straight ahead repeating his words make up my mind that you are the only man in the world <laughs> it's a rather egotistical game from the standpoint of the teacher isn't it of course i couldn't make up my mind on a subject like that off hand i might practice that go on she looks at him inquiringly what's the matter can't you remember the next step i thought you said you knew this game what do you do looks straight ahead quoting him again forget everything and everybody see only her face with its laughing eyes its wicked mouth and the dimple in her chin <laughs> well i'm afraid your experience isn't going to help me at all i can't go round seeing nothing but wicked mouths how would i ever play golf oh i beg your pardon you have to be serious do you that's one of the rules i suppose i hope i'll be able to grasp the rules by and by looks at him shyly we don't seem to be getting along very fast do we what do i do now huh? just love you is that all i i think that's one of the things i'd have to practice and what are you doing all this time may i ask surprise embarrassment tenderness hash across the girl's face really as much as that oh is that the way you score may i ask who taught you this game oh cupid the great professional no wonder you play so well rises but see the sun has quite gone and we must go i know i don't know very much about it yet but i might take another lesson tomorrow come along partner end of sketch number one sketch number two of modern monologues by marjorie benton cook this librivox recording is in the public domain stage directions and roles of Mrs. Anstrom and Winston Cat, read by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. A Modern Becky Sharp Scene My Lady's Boudoir Discovered My Lady stretched on a couch. She speaks. Oh! I'm tired and sleepy and cross. Tired and sleepy and cross. Tonight, my night, the night I've worked for and slaved for and lied for, and now I'm tired and sleepy and cross. That's the way. You want a thing with all your might and main, you work for it and get it, and then you wonder why you wanted it. Here I am tonight on a pinnacle of accomplishment and the hateful little fiend in my head saying why in the name of all that's silly have you spent two whole years trying to get an invitation to one of mrs jarvin's dinners you know why little fiend you know why mrs jarvin is our social saint peter she jangles her keys in the ears of the great unworthy and her nod her nod admits you to the innermost shrine. I've an insatiable curiosity about shrines myself. 
and St. Peter has nodded. Well, I've worked for it. Like the little corporal, I've climbed up over the dead bodies of all the friends God ever gave me, and God wasn't very generous to me. Not very. Oh, I suppose that little Winston cat will be there. I haven't forgotten our last conversation about the Jarvin's dinners. She had her first card and came to gloat. Of course, Mrs. Anstrom, you're going to the Jarvin's dinner. I? Oh, no. I understand this is her annual dinner to the bourgeoisie. You're going, of course. My dear, said the Winston cat, you'd sell your dirty little soul to go. And I would have. I would have. It's the only time I ever knew her to blunder upon the truth. I must be careful with the women. Not too grateful to the job in herself, I must cultivate that little male annex of hers and make myself irresistible to her ugly daughter. I'll snub the Winston royally. I may allow Mrs. Lambert to ask me to call. We'll see. I must be seen for at least five minutes with Mrs. George Alexander, and then, and then for the men, and diplomacy out of the window. A pair of eyes and a wit for the men, and hang your ancestors. <sighs> I must be calm, cool, and collected. I must remember that I'm not wedded to luck. Lord, no, I'm wedded to Jack Anstrom. May something happen to stop his stupid old mouth. Looks at her watch and turns quickly to touch a bell. Marie, why aren't you here to dress me? Marie, why do you keep me waiting? Don't you know that I dine at the Jarvins tonight? What? Toothache? What do you mean by having a toothache tonight? Why don't you have your teeth pulled? Where's my gown, Marie? Toothache or none, you should have had it here. Hasn't come. It's fate, fate against me. Well, it isn't the first time I've gone up against fate. Get a cab and go for it, Marie. No, have Annette call up Madame on the phone. Tell her I give her 15 minutes in which to get that gown here. Hurry up! This is absurd. I'm getting all excited. Well, did you tell her? Oh, what a face. Why didn't you go to the dentist this afternoon? No time. You have all the time there is. Money? Well, what do you do with all the money I give you, Marie? Is it... Is it really as long as that? Well, I see I must get you a check from somewhere, Marie. You're a very good maid, Marie, the best I ever had, and very patient. I appreciate it. I hope you'll get your reward sometime, Marie. In heaven, perhaps. And now do your best by me, Marie. I want to make a great sensation tonight. I want every woman in the room to envy me my maid. No, pilot up high in puffs and rolls, such as only you can accomplish. Take care, you're pulling. No, it doesn't need curling. It's curly enough. I don't want it to look like the Winstons. She always looks to me as if she's dressed in her sleep, and then her husband bustled in and hastily did her hair. Loosen that. No, higher. Higher there. Dear me, I never was so red in my life. When you're young and get excited, you're very, very pink. When, when you're middle-aged and excited, you get very red, and... After that, you get very purple. I wonder how many more years of the red stage I'm good for. Marie, you lie so delightfully that one is tempted to believe you. More hairpins? Through? Takes hand glass and inspects herself. Oh, Marie, I don't like it at all. What is the matter with it? Have you toothache in your fingertips? Oh, now, no, don't cry about it. Go away, Marie. Go to bed. Or the dentist or somewhere out of my sight. No, I don't want anyone to help me. I'll dress myself. Watches Marie depart. 
teeth. What are we coming to when our very servants have teeth? Shall I take that hair down or let it be? Turns at the entrance of a woman. Oh, you've come at last, have you? I thought perhaps Madame expected me to call for the gown on my way to dinner. Get it out at once, please. I'm in a great hurry. What's the matter at Madame Merton's that she sends out a gown ten minutes before it's to be worn? Sickness in the workroom? Nonsense. That's no excuse. Gets into skirt and struggles to get bound to meet. Well, whom did you make this band for? Certainly not for me. It's good three inches too small. Let it out, let it out. I can't breathe in the thing. Now, what are you going to do? Well, you've got to do something. Let it out, rip it, pin it, but do something. Ah, <gasps> oh, well, that's better. It isn't particularly comfortable yet, but I can breathe occasionally. Get me into the rest of the creation. I know I oughtn't to wear this colour tonight. With this red face and all this sparkle, I look like a bird of paradise. What do you think? No, oh, of course, you wouldn't know. Touch that bell, please. Now, where does this go? Indicates shoulder strap. I don't like the thing. Oh, here you are. Marie, what do you think? Do I look like a Christmas tree with all the candles lit? Brilliant, you think? Well, assume a virtue if you have it not. Hook this business, please. Go away now, Marie. You give me horrors. Who's that? No, don't come in, Jack. Stay where you are. Now I know it. I have a watch right here, and I know the exact time. Ouch! Take care, it's a pin. Jack, what have you done to yourself? You look exactly like a broiled lobster. No, 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 that's too tight. What strange misfortunes you do have with your dress shirts, dear. They always bulge in or bulge out. Why don't you sometimes strike a medium bulge? Now, don't tell me how I look. I know. To woman. Do you consider me into this thing? Tell Madame Merton that I think it's an abominable failure, and that I'll come and tell her so to myself tomorrow. Throw this around me, dear. Take care. Take care, my dear man. You're not putting a blanket on a horse. Come along. As far as I'm concerned, I feel more like a cannibal feast than a dinner with St. Peter. Exit. End of sketch number two. Sketch number three of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Binton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions and role of hostess read by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Her day at home. Scene. Drawing room. Discovered. The hostess and her best friend who assists. The hostess speaks. Ah, oh, isn't it absurd? Five o'clock, and about ten people here. If you announce your hours from four to six, everybody makes it a point to arrive at five-thirty and pack your rooms for twenty minutes. The next time I send out cards, I shall say from one o'clock on, and I'll have a mob here on the stroke of one to see whether or not I'm crazy. Oh, yes, Hartley's. I was there, were you? Why, of course, I talked to you for five minutes, didn't I? How stupid of me. To tell you the truth, I haven't an idea whom I saw or what I did. Did you ever see such a jam? I don't see how that woman has the courage to entertain in that tiny house. I was crushed and pulled. My gown was torn. I give you my word, I never expected to get out of there fully clad. When I was finally squeezed into the dining room by the crowd back of me, I succeeded after ages of patient waiting in getting a slim sandwich and a small piece of chocolate. Give you my word, dear, that's all I got. It certainly was an ideal afternoon. Inspects her empty rooms. I am so tired of standing here, aren't you? 
you know i can't see why with all our modern improvements we don't renovate our methods of entertaining some sort of big social clearing-house you know i could send in a list of people i wanted to entertain the man in charge would issue the cards and receive the replies and i'd be happy and the guests would be happy oh how do you do mrs marvel so glad to see you so good of you to come early you know mrs westcott yes it is a vile day to mrs w here they come thick and fast how do you do mrs thompson so glad to see you you know mrs westcott yes isn't it i never have any luck in weather mrs jeanette i'm so glad to see you i understand you're to be congratulated on the engagement of your daughter you must be so glad to get her settled at last it's lovely isn't it why miss knowlton how do you do haven't seen you for ages have you quite forsaken frivolity in mourning your father oh i beg your pardon i didn't know or at least i i think i must have forgotten the flowers i sent oh i am so glad you liked them mrs westcott this is miss knowlton how do you do great pleasure i'm sure passes her along a moment's breathing space mrs westcott didn't i tell you they'd all come at once here's that strange and wonderful mrs starr i always wanted to say to her twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are why mrs starr how do you do so glad to see you i was so broken-hearted that i missed your talk at mrs martin's on the analytic study of ragtime you didn't oh how stupid of me i've confused you with mrs bangor your subject is cooking in the eighteenth century isn't it you know mrs westcott to mrs w my dear did you hear what i said to her she and mrs bangor are sworn enemies here comes miss waite i've always thought her parents must have had a prophetic sense of humour when they named her carrie waite isn't she a whale how oh, do you do miss waite so glad to see you my dear girl what have you done to yourself no but you look so thin you do like to be told that i don't see why you should we know you're not fat you know mrs westcott mrs wright this is a pleasure and how is that dear husband of yours oh i i beg your pardon i mrs westcott mrs wright to mrs w well did you hear that i asked her how her husband was and she said she really didn't know she believed he was in europe i tell you it isn't safe to ask the simplest question of your dearest friend these days here comes mrs easton prepare for an avalanche her face assumes the gone look of one deluged with talk she makes ineffectual efforts to break in oh how do you do mrs easton so indeed oh i'm so glad no i should never have expected it really how dreadful i'm so sorry oh well that's better you know mrs to mrs w phew have you ever been able to get in a word edgewise i never have wonder if she ever runs down my dear i think they're all here let's plunge boldly in and see if we can get a cup of tea for love or money 
Come along. End of sketch number three. Sketch four of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions and role of Mrs. Derwent, read by Linda Olson, Vitak, Los Angeles. The Road of the Loving Heart. Scene. Drawing room at Mrs. Derwent's. Enter Mrs. Derwent and Alexander Walton. Mrs. Derwent. Home again, home. I think I must be an abnormal sort of creature, for sometimes I hate home. The same old things crowding you in, shutting out the sunshine and looking at you with the same old eyes. That squat, bronze idol is always laughing at me. I'd like to have a bonfire every week and burn up all my things. Hard on the insurance companies. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Well, things are always hard on somebody. She sinks down on couch and plays with her gloves. Tragic, you say? Oh, no, not tragic. Only tired. She makes an effort and continues brightly. How did you time your entrance so opportunely? A moment later, or a moment earlier, and you would have missed me. Your guardian spirit, she's still faithful then. I suppose it is a she. Well, the Kimballs? Oh, yes, I went. What? You were there? And just to see me? You must have come after I had gone. I hurried on to a reception somewhere. I've forgotten just where. Took in two teas, and now... Home again for an hour before the night work begins. Why do I do it? Well, it seems to keep me from thinking. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Automatic, you see. I'd hate to hear a phonographic report of the things I say on a day like today. Yes, dear, I am tired. I only seem to find rest when your arms are around me. And yet sometimes I think, Alex, that our meeting was the greatest misfortune that could have come to us. Please, dear, let me finish. If I'd been born of your class... No, no, you can't change facts, Alex. I was not, am not, of your class. Then there's the past... If one could kill and crush and forget the past. But one cannot. She walks to and fro. Your friends ask me about and treat me politely. But why? Because I am myself? Not at all. Because the great Alexander Walton has told the world that he intends to make me his wife. You've lifted me up so far, Alex. Ah, oh dear, I didn't mean to hurt you. Come, we won't talk of me any more. What has today brought you, my Alex? Crosses to his chair and leans above him. What, really? More honours? Ah, oh, Alex, you're climbing so high, and I'm away down here trying to see up to you. Yes, I am jealous, jealous of your fame, jealous of your honours, because they are taking you away from me. You have so much love, and I have only you. With all you have, you can't make one woman happy. Well, I suppose there are people born whose fate it is to see, to almost touch happiness, and yet never to reach it. You've given me all the joy I've ever had. But to have made me happy, you would have had to begin so far back. With my mother, perhaps. No, no, not that tonight. Don't let us go over all that again tonight. It can't be yet. 
I cannot marry you while you are in this fever of work. I'd only distract and bother you. Not until you have time for me. Well, perhaps that's not a pretty way to put it. I mean that you can't serve two mistresses. After we're married? Well, I suppose your wife and your work will have to compromise. When she rules, I'll slip away very quietly and hide. But when I reign, I want her buried. Dear me, so late. I fear, Sir Alex, I must send you away. I've only a moment left in which to dress, and I dine out. I'm so sorry. Yes, I know I'm unsatisfactory, but dinner waits for no man. Good night, my love. She watches him out and comes slowly back to couch. I suppose it's got to come. There is no use running away from thoughts. You can't shut out the in-betweens when the thoughts come crowding in. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Am I going to marry Alex and be happy at last? Well, why not? Life owes me a little happiness. God knows I've had none. And I can make him happy. I know I can. I'm playing with chances again, for there's always the past. Wherever I look, up or down, it's there. These women about me with their good, untempted lives behind them. They thrust it at me. Their suavest bows and insult. I suppose they call me. What is it? A woman with a past. Alex's wife. A woman with a... And he, poor boy, the only one who knows the story. He will have none of my warnings. He thinks he can march on up and carry me with him, my brave Alex. Well, he can't. I and my past will get in his way, and he'll stumble on us, and after a while he'll wonder why he... No, no. Alex's happiness, his success, I must not, I will not tamper with them. In the old days, before I learned to think, I might have taken the chances. But I didn't love Alex then. Smiles. It must have been before I was born. I've grown too big with love to drop back again. Half rises from the couch. Alex, you must go on alone, climbing to your heights. I, with my burden, can't keep step, and so I must fall out. Oh, Alex, Alex, if you knew what it means to me, the long, lonely road without you. But I choose it. I choose it for your sake, my Alex. The little bronze god and I, we must go on laughing. <laughs> Turns, half-dazed, as if interrupted. What is it, Marie? What is it? Ah, yes. I had forgotten that I dine out. Gets up slowly, as if numb, and drags herself out. End of sketch four. Sketch five of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions read by Eva Davis. Mrs. Northrop, read by Linda Olson Fytock. Mr. Reynolds, read by Nima. Bobby, read by Thomas Peter. Hilda, read by Linda Olson Fytock. Sketch five. What the janitor heard. Scene. Public telephone room, basement of the Montclair. Discovered. Mrs. Martin, waiting for her number. 
Enter Mrs. Northrop hastily. Mrs. Northrop. Good morning, Mrs. Martin. You're waiting to use the phone? Yes, isn't it a godsend? I couldn't live without it. I'm in such a muddle. Two unexpected guests to lunch, and Monday, and not a thing in the house to eat. I excused myself to go to the baby and ran down here. Have you got two nickels for this dime? Thank you so much. It's such a nuisance not to have nickels. Hello? Is this the grocery? Oh, excuse me, Central. I forgot to look it up. Gets down book. Now, wasn't that bright? I never can remember numbers, can you? Hello? South 4032, please. Yes, 4032. To Mrs. M. They're always so stupid when you're in a hurry. Hello? Is this Browns? I want to speak to Fred. Hello? Is this Fred? This is Mrs. Northrop. I have unexpected guests to lunch, Fred, and I want you to send me some things at once. Well, I don't know. What have you got? How much are fresh mushrooms? How much? Goodness! Send me canned. And can of peas. How much are new potatoes? No, that's simply outrageous. No, I don't want them at that price. To Mrs. M. Potatoes always seem ordinary to me, don't they, to you? Even if you do pay 65 cents for two or three. No, I'm not talking to you, Fred. I want two boxes of strawberries. I don't care how much they are. To Mrs. M. They always make an impression this time of year, don't you think so? No, I'm not talking to you, Fred. Six ripe tomatoes. Pick me up nice ones now. And Fred, have the butcher send me eight lamb chops. Extra nice. No, not today. I think that's all. I wonder if I've forgotten anything. Oh dear, the salad. Hello, Fred? No, Central. I want browns again. I did put a nickel in. Another one? Why, it's perfectly outrageous. I shall certainly complain to the manager. No. I want... To Mrs. M. Dear me. What was that number? Oh, yes. South 4032. Thanks. Hello, Fred. I want... Well, call Fred to the phone, please, quickly. I forgot to order a head of lettuce, Fred. No, that's all I think. I hope you'll get your number now, Mrs. Martin. Starts to go out, then returns quickly. Oh, would you mind waiting just a moment longer? I forgot the butter, and we haven't a bit. So sorry to interrupt you. In a hurry, too, are you? How kind you are. Hello? South 4032, please, quickly. Another nickel? Well, I'm still talking to Brown's Grocery. Well, I never heard of such a thing. Mrs. Martin, have you got another nickel? Thank you so much. Here it is, Central. Hello? Browns? I want Fred. Hello, Fred. A jar of butter, please, with my order. No, oh, this is Mrs. Northrop. My things have gone. Well, I'll give a boy a quarter to bring it over at once. And turns to Mrs. M. Thank you so much. What? 
I've taken all your nickels. Oh, what a shame. And I haven't a cent of change. Well, perhaps you could borrow it from the janitor. I am so sorry. Looks after Mrs. M. The idea of being so mean about five cents. I never did like the woman anyway. Two. Enter Mr. Reynolds. Determination writ large in every feature. Takes down the receiver, scowling. Hello. Give me Harrison one thousand. No, one thousand. Well, well. Ten double knot, if you must. I don't care what you call it if you give me the number. Hello. Is this Harrison one thousand? Well, ring off. I don't want you. Hello? Central. What's the matter with you people? I want ten double knot Harrison sometime before tonight. Hello? This is Reynolds. Yes, Reynolds. 225 Lafayette Avenue, top flat. Now, I've written you and telephoned you as often as I intend to about the steam heat in my flat. I've got a sick wife and small children, and I don't mean to have them freezing to death all the time. The thermometer hasn't registered above 60 for a week, and the janitor says he can't help it. Now, I've put up with your damn shilly-shallying long enough. Neither you get a man up here today to fix the pipes, or I'll get out next week. What's that? What? Not Smith? Who are you? Madame Marion's millinery? Why the deuce didn't you say so? Ring off. Rings up Central vigorously. Hello, Central. You have now given me three wrong numbers. Will you try once more? Sweetly. Harrison ten double knot. Yes, thank you. Is this Smith? Who is this? Well, I want to speak to Smith. Where? Milwaukee for two weeks? Ring off! Hangs up receiver with a woeful smile, which ends in a word we can't repeat. 3. Enter Mrs. Baldwin and Bobby, her son. Bobby speaks. Oh, no. Mama, I want to ring him up. Yes, I can. Why can't I? Well, when you've ringed him up, then can I talk to him? Why? Why do I have to be still? Now, can I? Now? He puts his mouth to the receiver, then, as if in obedience to mother's correction, puts it to his ear. Hello, Papa. Bet you don't know who this am. No, taint. To mother. He thinks it's you. No, taint, Mary. It's me. Yes, I do hear you. It's awful buzzy, though, in your ear, ain't it? I've been to the lake. Yep, and made boats. Me and little Evans. No, little Evans. L-I-T-T-L-E, Evans. No, he hasn't got any front name. Just little Evans. My boat sank it. No, it sank it in the water. To mother. No, I don't mean that. I mean sainted, Mama. Mama interrupted me. Little Evans was awful bad. No, I wasn't. Just little Evans. He most pushed me right in the water. He was this Duskustus. No, I said Duskustus. No, I don't, Mama. Mama's talking to me again. I have to get down now, because I'm so heavy, Mama says. Kisses him through the telephone. Did you get that? Goodbye, Pops. Come home soon. 4. Enter Hulda, of unmistakably Swedish features. She draws. Hello? Yas, the doctor live here. Huh? No? He is gone out. 
Yes, I can't keep coming back to lounge. I don't know. What is the name? Mrs. What? Huda? No, I don't catch him. Mrs. Huda? What? Oh, yes, Huda. What? Hammer? No. Homer? Oh, yes, I got him. Mrs. Hudelheimer. Where you been living? No, the number. 413? No, ain't that him? Oh, yes, I got him. 433 14th Street. No, oh, yes. 40th Street. Yes, I got him right now. What is the matter of you? No, what sicknesses you got? Oh, it is your little girl, huh? Dip? No, I don't hear you. Dip what? I don't know that word. You better call the doctor up when he come in. No, I don't know when he will be in. Sometimes he will be home before night and sometimes not. I don't know. Yes, I tell him. The stupid old thing. She can't talk the English good. End of sketch five. Sketch six of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions and Mrs. Marshall, read by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. In the merry month of May. Scene on the street. Mrs. Marshall meets a friend. Mrs. Marshall. Good morning, Mrs. Owen. Yes, it is a lovely morning, isn't it? To tell you the truth, I hadn't noticed it before. But you see, I'm in a state which precludes all attention to details like weather. Oh, my dear, it's worse than that. It's house hunting. No, of course you didn't, because we only decided to move yesterday. I went to see our landlord about repairs, and I got so perfectly furious at him that I gave up our house on the spot. I do hate these people who are always moving, but I tell you, they are the only ones who get things done for them. It's the old tenants who get no consideration nor repairs. As I said to Dick this morning, we've outgrown the house anyway, and we certainly can't do any worse. Just think of the houses that have everything built in. Why, we don't know the meaning of modern improvements, and certainly our present landlord will never instruct us. Of course, Dick's awfully cross about it. Men are such unprogressive creatures. Well, I must hurry along to that intelligence office, or whatever you call it. Thanks. I feel quite sure that I won't have any trouble. You see, I've found out in the old house all the things that I do not want. Goodbye, my dear. Scene. Real estate office. Mrs. Marshall enters briskly. Date, April 28th. Mrs. Marshall, cheerfully and decisively. Good morning. I want to get a list of desirable houses to rent. I want to tell you exactly what I want, so that I will not have to waste any time looking at impossibilities. I want a 12-room house with steam heat, 
three bathrooms bookcases sideboard and icebox built in i want a house which gets the sun in all its windows and i'd like one with some ground about it i prefer it on a boulevard and in a good neighbourhood of course oh yes i want it in a block where there are few children and i want a stable i do not wish to pay more than eighty dollars a month rent you understand just what i want do you several that would suit me you say well give me the list please as many as that one two three four why fifteen houses there must be a great number vacant this year going into apartments you say well i cannot understand how any self-respecting human being could live in one of those apartment buildings just like cliff dwellers i'll go and look at these houses this morning much obliged to you yes it is hot scene real estate office five o'clock of the same day mrs marshall enters mrs marshall with bubbling indignation i wish to see the young man who gave me this list of houses not here well do you expect him back tonight yes it is important i should like to ask him what he means by giving me such a list of impossibilities does he think that i have nothing to do but run around and look at such such atrocities here i've been this whole day in the broiling sun and i haven't seen a house i'd even consider now i told him exactly what i wanted it isn't as if i were one of these women who has no idea of what she wants i know precisely and i told him in plain english and he said he could suit me perfectly do you mean to say that you consider these your best houses why one of them actually had a tin-lined bathtub a big lawn well what of that you can't bathe on the lawn other houses but do you realize that this is the twenty eighth of april and i have to move the first of may i suppose i'll have to come back in the morning and i wish you would wait on me please i don't want anything more to do with that other young person owns the business does he well he oughtn't to he's utterly incompetent good afternoon scene real estate office mrs marshall enters date april twenty ninth mrs marshall do or die tone good morning what have you for me this morning this is a new list now will you please tell me just what to expect sunlight but no yard go on steam heat nice neighbourhood but only one bath grounds but nothing built in never mind about the rest i'll go look at them bit of luck well i hope so same day five p m mrs marshall enters mrs marshall tragic yes i've been to them all i've been through thirty-two houses in two days why people continue to build such ugly inconvenient unsatisfactory things i cannot see you have nothing more to suggest you think i've seen the best of them very well good evening scene real estate office date april thirtieth mrs marshall enters mrs marshall with absolute humility good morning what have you in in a modern up-to-date apartment yes i did say that but we've got to go somewhere and we've got to move tomorrow size anything from twelve rooms down to four 
rent i don't care my requirements i i haven't any i'll look at anything you think desirable i mustn't expect what to have the janitor built in i consider that impertinent sir this is the list of your best flats very well good morning same day noon mrs marshall enters mrs marshall despair i've seen them all i liked two but they wouldn't rent to me because i had children and a parrot we might give up the parrot you know but i can hardly be expected to part with my children scene on the street date may first mrs marshall meets a friend mrs marshall beamingly how do you do mrs owen was i smiling well i'm the happiest woman on earth do you know we're not going to move after all i canvassed the ground pretty thoroughly and decided that dick was right for once that it's better to bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of so i induced poor old dick to go to the landlord and say that i was a little hasty in my decision and that we had decided to stay it cost dick fifty dollars to buy off the new tenant but then as i told him it would have cost us more to move i find i'm really quite attached to the old place its faults endear it to me and then you know i do so hate those people who fold their tents like the arabs and silently steal away each year yes do come and see me in my old new house good-bye end of sketch six Sketch 7 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage directions read by Eva Davis. The Very Young Person. Read by Linda Olson Feitak. Mother. Read by Eva Davis. Up to Date Girl. Read by Linda Olson Feitak. Maggie Dogen. Read by Linda Olson Feitak. Sketch 7 Suburbanites. Scene Suburban Train. Enter a very young person who meets a friend. The very young person. Why, Betty Borden, how do you do? Where on earth did you come from? I haven't seen you in ages. Is that so? Boarding school. Isn't that fine? Of course, you liked it. Everybody always likes boarding school. Me? Oh, I'm still at Miss Smithers. I suppose I always shall be there. Like it? I should say not. I simply hate it. Why, that old woman, that Miss Smithers, she just spends her whole time making us girls miserable. I give you my word of honour that if a boy so much as puts his head around the corner of the street, she pulls down all the curtains that's a fact oh i just love to but my father won't hear of it he says he wants me right at home where he can see that my studies don't interfere with my social duties <laughs> silly isn't it he says he knows that if i went away to school i'd work myself into brain fever i never saw you look so well and that's the sweetest hat you've got on would you mind turning around oh it's lovely where do you get your hats do you now well i was never in there i'll just make mamma go in with me tomorrow hats are an awful bother don't you think so of course i never can have the kind i want i always have to get these young-looking things mamma makes me 
but i tell you one thing my spring suit is way down to the ground mm-hmm i've driven mamma to it at last why it's perfectly disgraceful there are plenty of girls in our school who have their clothes clear down to the ground when they're only thirteen years old and here i am almost sixteen and mine up to my ankles <gasps> there he is <laughs> claps hand over her mouth oh fudge i didn't mean to say that out loud that's just the trouble i don't know who he is i only know that he gets on my train in the morning and he takes this train every afternoon oh no not that thing i mean the third one with the pink cheeks and the curly hair isn't he a stunner sees his friend by wrist excitedly you don't mean to say that you know him we'll call him over and introduce him i'm just dying to meet him oh well never mind you can explain when we get him here oh go on please wait till he looks this way now he's looking ah oh, he saw us he's coming isn't he swell <laughs> nods how do you do <laughs> yes i've seen you before too yes i always take this train yes <laughs> i know you do i've seen you on it isn't it funny we never have met before i know lots of manual training boys oh yes i know him and fred and dick vaughan i should say i know all those fellows awfully nice crowd don't you think so sort of young but awfully nice what dick vaughan mercy no he's just a baby why i've known him since he was that high and he's only about thirteen oh he goes with lots of older fellows and all that but looks at conductor who interrupts her what oh ticket now what did i do with my ticket did you notice whether i had a pocket-book or not betty didn't i well maybe it's in my book shake's book no well you'll have to punch my ticket twice tomorrow conductor to boy oh now please don't thank you i do have the awfulest time with my ticket of course if i take my pocket-book it's all right because then it's in my pocket-book but if i don't i usually put it in one of my school books and then if i don't bring the same book home that i took to school why there i am why sometimes i owe the conductor as much as five punches dear me this is my station where did i put my other book would you mind moving betty no it isn't there oh thank you didn't i have an umbrella i thought i did i'm getting off here conductor do come and see me while you're home to boy i i <laughs> i suppose i'll see you in the morning goodbye two enter mother and small boy martimus mother now hurry along martimus hurry lifts him into seat now you sit still and be a little gentleman she looks about car and back to martimus yes we are going now yes the engine is pulling us what makes the engine go why why the engineer dearie mm-hmm the engineer turn around martimus and let mamma tie your necktie now hold still she unties and ties his tie again nonsense now i didn't pull it tight enough to hurt you scratch what your collar where here oh that doesn't scratch much i can't help it if it does you have to wear a collar when you go to town because you do gentlemen always wear collars i don't know why yes that's the lake mm-hmm it's very deep no not a million miles but deep quite deep martimus take your feet off my dress look at that now brushes herself vigorously 
turn around and let me put your cap on straight. I never saw anything like the way you wear your cap. Now, let it alone. I don't care how the boys wear theirs. I want you to wear yours the way I put it on you. Martimus, don't do that again. Haven't you a handkerchief? Well, what have you two for? Laughs. One for each nose. Well, you'd better use them both. That's right. Now put them back in your pocket. No, no, one in each pocket, silly. Looks out the window. No, this doesn't seem to be a station. I suppose we're slowing up to... to let off uh, smoke or something or other. No, now, this window is just as good as that. Well, my dear, if that is the only thing that will give you happiness, go over there. But be careful. She helps him across. Martimus. Oh, Martimus. Come here to Mama. Come here a moment. Put up your foot. I want to tuck your shoestrings in. I never saw such floppy things. Now, you may go back. Careful. Oh, I knew you'd do that. Sh sh come here to me. Stop that noise. I never heard such yelling. Come here. Takes him in her arms and rocks to and fro. There, there. Where did him hurt him? Mama kiss it. There, there. Look at that little baby staring at you. Ain't you ashamed? Now, you turn round here at your own window. Yes. Yes, I see. It's a freight car. I don't know what's in it. I expect coal or cows. Oh, it isn't a coal car? Well, it must be something else, then. Yes, that steam. Martimus, you do ask such silly questions. I don't know anything about steam or cars or cows or coal. You ask Papa when he comes home. He'll know. Now, what are you going to do? Do sit still like a gentleman. What? Oh, the baby. Isn't it cute? Wiggles hand at baby across the aisle in the usual asinine manner for attracting a baby's attention. How do, baby? How do? To Martimus. Isn't that cunning? Did you see that smile? What? You want to kiss that baby? Well... I don't know whether it's Mama will let you or not. You might go and ask her. But do be careful now. We don't want you falling down again. Helps him across, then claps her hands and calls him back. Why, Martimus, what do you mean by grabbing that little baby by the top of the head? Of course it's soft there. All babies are like that. Well, because they are. I don't know why. No, your head isn't, because you're not a baby. No, mine isn't, because I'm grown up. Papa's? Well, I sometimes think that Papa's is a little soft yet. Oh, this is our station. Now, don't stop to ask questions. Come along. Drags him off, finally picks him up, and runs off. 3. Enter an up-to-date girl. She is joined by Mr. Atwood. She speaks. Good morning, Mr. Atwood. Won't you join me? And how do you fare this perfect day? Yes, it certainly is charming. You know, I think weather is the only thing I'm conservative about. I'm all for extremes in everything else. You think so? Women are more apt to be extremists than men, you say? Well, perhaps. I never thought of it. Of course, you men are so overburdened with logic, reason, and all such drawbacks. Now we women just jump at our conclusions and sense the in-betweens, while you poor plotters are conscientiously exploring. No, no, I disagree with you. I think nine times out of ten we arrive at the same conclusions, and you must admit, our method is shorter. Leans over and bows to the woman who passes. Why, how do you do, Mrs. Stearns? I didn't see you. 
thank you. I am hoping too soon. To Mr. Atwood. Has she been sitting there all the time? How stupid of me not to have seen her. Do I like her? Yes, immensely. She's so frankly detestable. Most women are, you know, but not frankly. She says more nasty things in a minute than you can repeat in an hour, and yet she never seems to have any malice. A keen eye for human failings and a sharp tongue for summing them up. And it's all done in the sort of impersonal attitude of the historian, don't you know? Oh, she's clever. No, no, men don't like her. She's too smart. Well, that's what I mean. I don't think men do like clever women. They like them in books, but they're afraid of them in the flesh. Oh, well, of course women like clever men. But then women like men to be their equals, and you men, you like women to be on the next lower mental plane. Did that man call Elmswood? I'm off at the next station. Yes, I'm going to the club to play golf. I go round every day now with a professional. Getting ready for the tournament, you know. We take our games so seriously these days, don't you think we do? I always seem to be getting ready for a match, or getting over a match, and it's a maximum of hard work and a minimum of pleasure, and of course I wouldn't do it if I weren't such an odious old peacock thirsting for success at things. Well, here we are. I'm glad to have seen you. Thanks. I'll work very hard and pray for luck. What more can a mortal do? 4. Enter Maggie Dugan and Annie O'Brien. Maggie. Now hurry right along, Annie O'Brien, and take the first seat you come to. Here you are. Drops into seat and gets up again quickly. I beg your pardon, sir. I didn't see you get down first. I hope I didn't hurt you, sir. Well, that's good. Aside. I almost squashed him. Here you are now, Annie. Sit down. I don't want to sit down. I wouldn't sit down if I could. I'd rather sit down standing up. I'll grab onto one of these hoops. She steadies herself by loop. It's awful crowded at this time of night, ain't it, Annie? Sure thing. Yes, I've been out all day. It's my day out. I bought me a ulster, Annie. Silk lined and fancy trimmed. Ah, it was a swell thing. Eight dollars and thirty-eight cents. Would you believe it? Ah, it's a swell thing. No, ain't so tired. I wouldn't be tired at all if it wasn't that I'm wearing the mistress's old boots and they nearly kill my feet. And where are you living now, Annie? Are you? And do you like the place? Utter surprise and horror. <gasps> you don't tell me. She won't let you play the coronet? Why, what do you stay for, Annie? I wouldn't stay a minute with a woman that wouldn't let me play the coronet. Why don't you bring her up before the union? Ah, oh, yes, I got a nice place. Most suits me. But I says to her before I went there, I says, Now I want one hour on the morning to practice music and one hour after lunch to take me nap. The butler's got to be Irish, so we'll be congenial, and I says, if I want a few friends in now and then for dinner, I don't want no kick coming, see? And she says to me, she says, would you mind if me and the family just stopped in the house while you're with us? And I says, I don't mind at all at all, I says, but if you promise me these things and don't do em, I says, I'll have you up before the union and you'll sit in the kitchen and whistle for a cook. I says, and she knows I was telling the truth. I got her coming all right, all right. She's meek as a lamb, Annie. She never peeps. I tell you all you got to do is make up your mind to your rights and learn to handle the upper classes, and it's easy, it's easy. By God, this is my station. Come round and see me, Annie. Come round and see me and the butler. So long, Annie. So long.
End of Sketch 7「Sketch 8 of Modern Monologues by Marjorie Benton Cook」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage Directions and Woman in Automobile Read by Linda Olson Feitak, Los Angeles They are last ride together. Scene Country road with village in the distance. Discovered a man and a woman in an automobile. She speaks oh it is ideal the softest air and the bluest sky and the yellowest fields well but you would see them if you'd just look at them i feel like flying on a day like this and this dear old machine is almost as good as wings god bless the man who invented automobiles she leans out and laughs softly <laughs> oh see stop a minute slow up see him the yellow lizard on the rock to lizard how do you do sir <laughs> see him wriggle that's the way he bows i see it now i see it all that's what i was last incarnation a beautiful yellow green lizard with nothing on earth to do all day long but sun myself on a warm rock no brain no thoughts no responsibilities just food and sleep idyllic you don't like my lizard idea i take it ah <sighs> you're such an unappreciative creature do i do you an injustice well i'll amend it and say your appreciative powers are strictly limited Alas, that spring should vanish with the rose, breaks off with deep sigh in answer to his remark. Ah, oh dear me, now there you go. Art, literature, science, trees, lizards, all roads with you lead back to love. Why? Why will you always hark back to that tabooed subject? I have no patience with a man who has but one idea and presents it to you every time he opens his mouth. What sort of man do I like? Well, I can't tell you exactly. I can't give you a list of required virtues any more than I can tell you just how to make fudges. But I can make them. I sort of feel what ought to go in. Oh, you are incorrigible. You harry an idea to the very topmost branches. I... I... Oh, I don't know. It's such a silly conversation. I just wish I'd been one of those Sabine women, snatched up and carried off willy-nilly, with no time to weigh this man with that and choose. I love being carried off and conquered in spite of myself. Then I could fight until the last flag went down and live peacefully ever after. Turns to look at him quickly, then laughs. <laughs> you? How could you? Would you kidnap me in the dark and carry me off in a handsome cab? How would you go about it? Alas, and alack, we have to go to Richard Carvel and to have and to hold for our romance in these lacklustre days hums again lightly the nightingale that in the branches sang our winds and with a flown again who knows looks at man then at machine then up the road toward the town they are approaching what are you doing seriously what are you doing? Don't you see we're coming to a town? Well, slow up. We're going at a dreadful rate. Anxiously. What is it? Is there anything the matter with the thing? Excitedly. Why don't you do something? Oh, oh, oh is it running away? Turns to him in utter amazement and annoyance. Marry you? Certainly not. 
i think you'd better give your entire attention to the machine and let matrimony alone the girl begins to look terrified we're going faster and faster we'll be killed if we go through that town at this rate well i don't want to be killed with you or anybody else oh see there's somebody on the road she half rises and calls look out oh man look out we can't stop this thing turns to man beside her i command you to stop if you can't i'm going to jump don't touch me oh heavens we're in the town now she looks about her as if they were going at high speed calls look out little boy do you want to get run over hangs out of otto and calls back to him the rest of our sentence you silly little idiot to man beside her just look at the crowd after us oh i hate you and a policeman she starts up suddenly her eyes wide with terror and points straight ahead look look we're going toward the river horror oh turns to him quickly marry you oh yes yes if you could only stop this infernal machine any time now here wherever you say only just stop it yes i love you with all my heart and soul but if you don't hurry up i won't love you long as otto begins to slow up she sits with her hands over her eyes catching her breath painfully the machine stops with a jerk and she looks up turns to man and breaks out angrily do you mean to say that you could have stopped it as easily as that at any time looks ahead and and there is a bridge you knew there was a bridge rises going i'm going home by the train i don't care what you think i'm going on the train she jumps out superbly i certainly do not consider myself engaged to you you wrung my consent from me under false pretenses i beg your pardon i did not say that at all i said that if i had been one of those sabine women no doubt i'd have liked being carried off of course having no sense of humour you misunderstood me i bid you a very good afternoon a very good afternoon end of sketch eight sketch nine of modern monologues by marjorie benton cook this librivox recording is in the public domain Stage directions read by Thomas Peter. Lady Macbeth and Portia, read by Linda Olson Fytak. Juliet, read by Lian Yao. Ophelia, read by Eva Davis. Sketch nine, when shades assemble. Scene, the afterworld. Enter Lady Macbeth and Portia. Lady Macbeth. Good morrow, Lady Portia, Cato's daughter, wife of that Brutus who did slay great Caesar. Why stalk you here among the shades alone? Portia. Such words as slayer sound but ill, methinks, upon the lips of guilty Corda's wife. My Brutus was a martyr who did read signs of the times which others dared not see. The blood he shed was shed in duty's name. So say not Slayer's wife again to me, thou who didst lure beneath thy roof King Duncan, and with thy two blood-stained hands didst, with thy husband's aid and foul connivance, kill, stab, and murder there thy king. Lady Macbeth, hastily. Enough, enough, fair Portia, this sufficeth. Our husbands may have had their little faults, no doubt we had our little vices too but here among the shades where friends are few let us not waste the hours in angry speech 
but join our forces that we may not be dependent for all social intercourse upon ophelia and that youngster juliet portia who even now approach from out the dusk enter juliet and ophelia juliet dear me ophelia but this life is slow why when i lived at fair verona's court my every day was filled with gracious sport can i forget that ball my father gave when first i set my eyes on romeo lady macbeth aside methinks that we have heard that tale before ophelia softly beware there's cador's dame who gossips so lord we may know what we are but know not what we may be how should i my true love know from another one by his cockle hat and staff and his sandal shorn portia ophelia my dear know you no other songs alas sweet lady and alas alack why at verona's court the troubadours were wont to dedicate their songs to me alas we can't escape verona's court juliet angrily dost think we'd rather hear of corder's house and duncan's death and see you wash your hands and hear your thrilly speeches about blood not i for one nor mad ophelia here i'd rather sit and hear ophelia sing and that's not very cheerful you'll admit lady macbeth indignantly thou impudentest child among the shades the raven himself is hoarse that can outcroak you chastise the valour of thy saucy tongue be gone about thy business get thee hence portia sweetly be not impatient with the child my lady she's young yet and poor soul she died for love yes and i'm sorry i was such a fool oh why did i not wed the count of paris instead of joining romeo in the tomb but romeo loves thee still yes romeo does why at the time when all the heroes are let in to spend the day with their lost wives and loves what think ye then this romeo does well what doth he he sits all day and holds ophelia's hand how shall i thy true love know from another one -la 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 -la. the montagues were ever fickle loves i care not that he pays ophelia court but this is hard that i must have lord hamlet being or not being at my side discoursing on man's capability and talking ghosts until my very spine is chilled and every hair doth rise like quills upon the fretful porcupine how dare you use a speech that's not your own oh i'm so glad he does speak thus with thee for i was ever much afeard of him he said to get me to a nunnery oh woe is me to have seen what i have seen see what i see he is dead and gone lady he is dead and gone methinks ophelia is just a simple thing i would sometimes i could escape my thing the days he is allowed to visit me i grow a-weary of reiteration that bickering outworn phrase i told you so children dear lady ours the fate has been for centuries to face the limelight's glare and in the world of mortals still the young do play at juliet's and ophelia's parts and murder worse than that of corder's thane is yearly done upon our splendid lines yet spite of this we ever do remain heroes and heroines of classic lore what matter then if in this dim beyond some private woes and family bickerings do mar the tenor of our even ways this is the penalty we pay for fame a fame which even elocutionists have failed to ruin and entirely mar a fame which though the idle shattering world may try it cannot rob us of it needs us still so ladies 
let's in silence bear the wounds of private life and let us turn a smiling face unto the shades without end of sketch nine sketch ten of modern monologues by marjorie benton cook this librivox recording is in the public domain stage directions read by thomas peter mr meek read by nemo mrs ten brook read by sonia carol kendall read by eva davis sketch ten over the coffee cups scene breakfast table discovered mrs meek waiting breakfast for her better half enter mr meek looking the worse for wear mr meek morning elizabeth crossly james why wasn't i called for breakfast harris thought i wanted to sleep well harris isn't hired to think he's hired to carry out my orders hurry up with things i've an engagement opening and glancing over paper my dear i make it a point not to know what time i get in four o'clock i don't doubt it it was so thoughtful of you to stay awake and keep track of the time soft boiled eggs ugh take them away don't you dare put the things in front of me aren't we ever to have anything but eggs for breakfast i'd gladly exterminate the whole kingdom of egg-producing animals give me a chop james and be quick about it tries paper again but puts it down at miss meek's sigh is there anything particular the matter with you this morning my dear you certainly would depress a grave-digger i tell you a man has a right to demand a cheerful face at the breakfast-table me i am cheerful i came down in the best of humours ready to make myself agreeable and your first remark put me on edge for the day haven't made any remark well it must have been your expression then it was something looks at paper a minute then throws it down can't you talk a little or is it against the rules oh mamma is coming is she that'll be nice when does she arrive today sorry i can't be home to dinner ring the bell will you what is that man doing james has the cook gone for the chop well i hope so bring me a bromo seltzer ah is this the chop tries it tough tough i can't eat it no i don't want it i don't want anything i'll get something downtown madame despair i leave you to enjoy your miseries tell mamma about them she'll sympathize no doubt ta ta exit two scene same discovered mrs tenbrook looking squally enter mr tenbrook with affable and ingratiating manner mrs tenbrook in tone between tears and indignation good morning yes you may bring in the breakfast now jane i suppose it's as cold as a brick to mr t a good many people told me that matrimony wasn't all smooth sailing and i thought i was prepared for anything i'm sure the night before i was married i read a whole book of quotations about marriage not being a path of roses but i never supposed that after only three years you'd get in at such an hour as you did last night and then throw epithets and things at me when i came in to see if you wanted any breakfast it's very strange you thought it was your man when i came clear into the room and spoke to you there was a time when you would have known my voice silence then she begins again i try so hard to be reasonable it just takes all my self-control not to ask where you went last night but i won't ask not at all whatever suspicions i may have 
i will be silent oh i can be silent if there is any necessity i'm not like you i have my tongue under perfect control i don't see why you can't be amusing at the breakfast table when you've been frisking about all night goodness knows where having a good time what is it emerson says about a cheerful face at the breakfast table no that is not from my book of quotations such a night every board in the house creaked and there was a mouse somewhere and such noises outside every time i was just dropping off i thought i heard your latch key squeak bad habit waiting up i suppose it is but like some of yours it's hard to break i'm sure my father never got in at any such hour as you did last night well my mother never had any occasion to row at him as you elegantly express it yes she was a model but bear in mind she had a model husband i'm just like mother though i'll do anything on earth to avoid trouble i can't bear women who nag my motto is patient endurance through you haven't eaten a thing i shouldn't think you would be hungry after what you probably had last night lifts a martyr cheek for his parting kiss good-bye watches him out what martyrs what blessed silent unappreciated martyrs we women are three scene same discovered mr and mrs kendall and arthur kendall enter carol kendall carol good morning mother d morning dad laddie what's the joke what were you laughing at oh the guardian of the hearth again what's she done now served pudding for breakfast what eggs and teacups oh lovely and nothing else ah i see eggs simply a sign of things that are not and a promise of things hoped for well we have to admit that time himself is a flyer beside this cook yes mother dear she is thorough and good-natured but even you must grant that breakfast begun at seven and finished at eleven is a strain mother you'd find virtue in a a, a pumpkin what's the news dad wait let me guess first column shootings and hold-ups two somebody declares war three scandal in social circles four article on trusts three out of four right huh laddie i'm coming to town today i'll do myself the honor of lunching with you thanks what broke really well never mind i'll take you dad you're invited strictly dutch treat hand to ear cheer up friends i hear a movement in the kitchen perchance the coffee is approaching no false alarm now don't let it ruffle you father pin your mind to the virtues mother's ferreted out she's thorough and clean cleanliness has always seemed a bit negative to me but they do say it's next to godliness ah here we are at last let every man fall to there's nothing like this period of preparation trains the temper induces patience what's the appetite there's the postman's ring i'll go dashes off and back everybody gets a letter oh must you go so soon dad bother the train you aren't half through your breakfast calls after dad mother says wear your ulster weatherman says colder meet you boys at one o'clock good-bye opens letters singing there were two jolly gentlemen who went away to sea nice boys aren't they mother well dear if i'm to take a noon train to work to work says the little red hen end of sketch ten sketch eleven of modern monologues by marjorie benton cook this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stage Directions, read by Tricia G. 
Reginald, read by Thomas Peter. Angelina, read by T.J. Burns. Billy Norton, read by Thomas Peter. Joan Descott, read by T.J. Burns. From long ago to now. Then, scene: Miss Angelina's drawing room. Enter Reginald. Miss Angelina, how good you are to see me. Shyly, am I? No, but I'm not. For I wanted to see you. Regretfully, I. I am so unworthy. I don't quite understand mysteriously no of course not nervously will you will you let me make you a cup of tea how heavenly kind you are strong or weak absently both what oh i mean either sugar it needs none your hands have made it oh miss waring angelina i have something on my mind horrified have you oh i'm so sorry won't you take a caraway cake i think they are good when you have a uh tragically miss waring angelina what do you think of love bewildered i oh mr reginald i think someone is calling me seizes her arm no stay angelina don't leave me yet let me unburden my mind what do you think of love with bent head oh mr reginald i don't know i think it must be very pleasant pleasant angelina love is a fiery furnace that consumes burns tortures kills terrified oh no mr reginald i know angelina for i burn and die what shall i do shall i call mother mother no none can help me save one and she is so far above me that i dare not aspire to even gaze upon her plucking up courage is she fair rapturously fair she is so fair that she dazzles and blinds her slaves does she know you love her can she be ignorant when love is writ large in every feature and yet she doesn't love you love me impossible then she must be a horrid thing with air of wisdom men were made to love women and women were made to love men and if they pretend they don't why there there i'm sure of it if i thought there was hope why don't you ask her i dare not what's her name i'll ask her for you you angel her name is angelina waring overcome me i'm the angel oh mr reginald at her feet ah <sighs> i know i am not worthy to sit at your feet angelina but love makes me bold could you entrust your life to me do you love me half crying i i don't know i hides her face oh dear me i think i do angelina i shall build a shrine for you my queen and worship at your feet all the days of my life i'm so glad you love me did you ever love anyone else no angel takes her in his arms 
I don't see why you didn't think love was pleasant, Reginald. I think it's just... sweet. Angel! Now. Scene. Porch of a clubhouse. Enter Joan Dascott and Billy Norton. That was a good two-step, Billy. And this is a good night. Let's sit here a moment. My dear fellow, you're puffing. You're getting too old to dance. Indignantly. Puffing? Your grandmother. We'd better go back. Music, they say, hath charms to soothe the savage. Do sit down and stop pacing. It makes me tired to watch you. Truth is, Joan, I've something on my mind. On your what? This may be a joke to you, but it's dead earnest to me. What are you driving at? Fact is, I want to talk to you seriously, Joan. Laughs. <laughs> seriously? All right, Billy, fire away. Uncomfortably. You know, Joan, I, I'm not much on love. Well, there's nothing serious in that. It's only when you are much on love. Or in it. Don't chaff me. I'm in earnest. Apologize. I say, uh, not very long on love pattern or that. But I found the girl for me, all right, and... Shortly. Well, you're in luck. What more do you want? I want you to advise me, old lady. Truth is, I don't think she has much use for me. What makes you think so? Well, I don't know. I just think so. Why don't you brace up and ask her like a man? I sort of dread to, for fear she'll turn me down and not let me see her any more. I see. You prefer a miserable possibility to a miserable certainty. Earnestly. Do you think I'd have any chance with a girl, Joan? Depends on the girl. Desperately. I don't see how I could stand much show. Modest flower, who is your iceberg, Billy? Why, uh, it's... it's you, you know. Me? Oh, great doodle, what are you talking about? It's gospel, Joan. It's always been you. Is this a moon spell? Do you have these fits often? Taint a fit. Tis chronic. You ought to see a specialist about it. That's why I've come to you. Well, I can't take your case. The chronic ward is full. Don't joke about it, Joan. I'm in dead earnest. Do you think you could ever care anything about me, dear? I don't know whether I care or not. I never have thought anything about it. Well... Could you... could you take a little time to think about it? Well, I... go on in and dance this. I'm going to stay here. Don't talk, Billy. Just go. Tell Jack Gardner that I've gone home if he asks for me. Half an hour later. Still here, Joan. A penny for you. I've been thinking it over, Billy. I suppose I've always cared a good deal. I didn't know it. Then it's an advantage that we know each other so well. And I was thinking that if we got married, we might go into the American Golf Championship together down at Lennox this year. Then it's yes, Joan? Mm-hmm. God bless you. I hope we'll have good luck, old lady. In the championship? Smiling. In the championship. End of sketch 11.